First Timothy chapter 6 verse 1 Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of Elohim and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Doulos is better translated slaves. Zugos, Greek for yoke, pertains to that of bondage in slavery. The first century saints recognized slavery as part of society and would have had Christian slaves within the congregations. Whether or not their masters were Christian or pagan, they were exhorted to show reverence and not behave in an untoward manner that could possibly jeopardize the body of Messiah as a whole. By so doing, the name of Yehovah would not risk being blasphemed through a slave's breaking of the teachings of Elohim. Rebellion against their masters would deny their masters the opportunity of seeing the good Christian conduct of their slaves, which could possibly lead to the, their souls being won. Yehovah's name is blasphemed indirectly by believers who deny others an opportunity to gain entry into the kingdom of heaven through terrible representation of the faith which may dissuade their souls from being one from being one this statement of mine is substantiated in Romans 2 verses 23 to 24 Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou Elohim? For the name of Elohim is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. There is currently a massive conscription of souls into Islam, especially in former Christian nations, due to the lukewarm churches which accept sin in the church such as homosexuality, abortion and transgenderism having made Christianity appear so despicable and undesirable to the point of potential souls for Yeshua being lost to false pagan religions. Note also in Romans 2 verses 23 and 24 that those who are blaspheming the name of Yehovah through preventing would-be souls of Yeshua being one from entering uh, the true faith of Christianity that the reason that they are doing so is through breaking of the law as we see in verse 23 thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou Elohim so because in current Christendom the law has not been adhered to and has been abolished from the churches due to misinterpretation of scripture this has led to christianity being a chaotic religion where there is no order where everything goes and apparently all you need to do is accept jesus as your savior say the sinner's prayer and that's meant to be your insurance from going to hell but so many deluded souls and deceived souls are in the lap of Satan, satiated to the hilt by his lies and devices, foolishly believing that they're going to heaven, and through their conduct of not obeying Torah, the rest of the world who would want to enter the Christian faith as well are distract are dissuaded by this poor behavior of those who are peddling a false version of the gospel and by so doing they're blaspheming the name of Yehovah. So this is yet another of countless evidences of the law still being relevant, having always been relevant, will always be relevant forever until heaven and earth pass away. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2 And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, 
because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. As for the slaves of Christian masters, they were exhorted not to disesteem them, mostly because they were, fe they were fellow members of the body of Messiah. Rather, they were to carry out their duties obediently. Although in the body of Messiah, Elohim is no respecter of persons, this does not mean that insubordination may prevail in the worldly ranks of human society. The believing master, being also part of the body of Messiah, is also a beneficiary of the promise of eternal life, provided he ran his course as well as expected of every other member in the congregation. Let's compare this with Galatians 3, verses 28 to 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Messiah Yeshua. So in spirit we are all one in Messiah, and there is no respecter of person, persons. However, the reality is that in our society, we do, our society is not spiritual, it is physical. So we are supposed to ensure that we do not express insubordination in the society that we live in. However, when it comes to the congregation of Israel and the body of Messiah, which is the body of Messiah, spiritually there is no respecter of persons. There is no male or female, there is no bond nor free, there is no Jew nor Gentile. We are all one in Messiah Yeshua. Let's also look at 1 Peter 2 verses 17 to 20. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear Elohim, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. The word translated froward here in the, he in the Greek is skolios, which means crooked or wicked. So even if the master is wicked, we are still supposed to be subject to them because we are living in a carnal society. However, when it comes to the congregation of Israel, the body of Messiah, we are all, we are all one. And there's no respecter of persons. Verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward Elohim endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with Elohim. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 4 and verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our master Yeshua the Messiah, and to the doctrine which is according to holiness, Paul was given direct revelation by Yeshua himself. And we see this expressed in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 6. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of Yehovah. I knew a man in Messiah about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. Elohim knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell. Elohim knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. The teachings that he was sharing with Timothy for dissemination to the Ecclesia were hence divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit 
and are doctrinally sound. Besides, Yeshua had indirectly taught the same principles. And we see this in Matthew 5, verses 5, 43 and 44. So we'll start with Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then verse 43 to 44. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So this is pretty much the same message that's been given to these slaves and their masters. Also, Matthew 22, verse 21. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto Elohim the things that are Elohim's. So although, the, although Elohim is not a respecter of persons, this is in terms of the spiritual body of Messiah. In the physical world that we live in, even Yeshua the Messiah himself said that we must render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. So in this physical world that we live in, insubordination is not tolerated by the gospel because it goes against the principles of the gospel. Despite the fact that we are equal, we, we, we are, there is no respect of persons spiritually. However, there is a rank and file in society in this physical world that we live in. And it's, we need to abide by the rules that are in society. Also, let's have a look at Luke 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and but doting about questions and strife, strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is holiness, from such withdraw thyself. There are many contentious Christians who harp on about doctrines that they do not understand and frustrate the progressive dissemination of gospel truth to the masses by pointless debates and wrangling about empty and trifling matters. This culminates in jealousy, contention, slander and evil suspicions. Compare this verse with these verses with 2 Timothy 2 verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And also Jude 1 verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking about their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Such meddlesome individuals have decayed, have decayed minds, deprived of truth, whose goal is monetary gain. This is truly descriptive of the vultures masquerading as men of the cloth who twist every scripture in their, in their reach to preach money out of, their or out of their followers. We are to dissociate ourselves from such agents of the devil. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But holiness with contentment is great gain. Piety towards Elohim from a heart that desires not the vain, from a heart that desires not the vain, fleeting rich, uh, riches of this world, is the great acquisition we must aspire for, as truly holy saints. Let's compare this verse with Hebrews thirteen verse five. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
also in Proverbs 16, verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. This plain verse needs no commentary. I shall simply compare Job 1 verse 21 and Ecclesiastes 5 verses 15 and 16. So we'll start with Job 1 verse 21. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Yehovah gave, and Yehovah hath taken away. Blessed be the name of Yehovah. Ecclesiastes 5 verses 15 and 16. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 8 and 9. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in the destruction and in destruction and perdition. Desiring anything above food and clothing attracts temptation from the kingdom of Satan. Worldly riches and the desire for such gain are the devil's playing ground. Many preachers who appeared to commence their ministries with genuinely righteous intentions have time and time again fallen for the destructive snare of earthly gain. Let's look at Matthew 6 verses 25 to 33. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if Elohim so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things, do the Gentiles seek? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So many Christians pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Lead us not into temptation. Yet in the same vein, pray for riches and worldly gain, which leads directly into temptation. James 1.8 is sadly descriptive of many. And it says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So, injuri so injurious are the longings for wealth that it sinks one into olethros, which is Greek for destruction of the flesh, and apoleia, which is Greek for perdition, destruction of the soul in eternal misery in hell. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Philaguria, which is Greek for love of money or avarice, is indeed the root of all evil as temptation stems from this fetid love. Once tempted, 
one then wrestles between choosing good and evil, the lust of the flesh unfortunately usually triumphing. The subsequent sin leads to death, and this process is spelt out in James 1 verses 14 to 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Coveting money takes up so much of our valuable time, which should be spent on focusing on Messiah and things of the heavenly kingdom. This destructive preoccupation causes one to stray from the faith, and is rightly compared with piercing oneself with many sorrows. The demon god Mammon competes with Yehovah for worship in this respect, and much to the detriment of the hope of salvation for many, this is lost when Mammon is chosen over Yehovah. Let's read Psalm 16 verse 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another Elohim, Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. So these sorrows are multiplied when, especially Christians, when they hasten, obviously the rest of the world, the lost world, when they hasten after another Elohim, in this case, the Elohim being Mammon, the god of money. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. And then Matthew 6, verse 24, from the very own words of Yeshua say, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve Elohim and Mammon, or as most most people say in English, Mammon. So this demon god Mammon, or Mammon, has unfortunately hoodwinked most into being chosen over Yehovah Elohim. And most people do it so unwittingly, much to their detriment, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 But thou, O man of Elohim, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, holiness, faith, love, patience, meekness. As saints faithful to the gospel, we should flee from any form of desire for riches and focus more on the spiritual battle at hand, which, for one to emerge victorious, requires a daikaiosune, which is Greek for righteousness or purity, which can only be achieved by observing the Torah, the Torah of Elohim through faith. Compare Romans 10, verse 4 and 5. For Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The word end there is the Greek word telos, which means the purpose or the goal or the limit. So Messiah is the purpose or the goal or the limit of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. B. Eusebia, which is Greek for piety and reverence towards Elohim, again exhibited by observing Torah. Compare John 14 verse 15 and John 15 verse 10. John 14 verse 15, the words of Yeshua again, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And John 15, verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. C. Faith, which leads to justification. Faith without good works, that's to say Torah observance, is dead. And we see this explained thoroughly in James 2, verses 11, 20, 22, and 24. We'll start with James 2, verse 11. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, 
thou art become a transgressor of the law. And then verse 20 of the same chapter. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 22. Seest thou how faith, how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And lastly, verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. It's so crystal clear. D. Agape. Brotherly love in a social or moral sense. E. Patience. Which worketh experience against enmity, leading to spiritual growth and greater strength against Satan's kingdom. And we see this explained in Romans 5 verse 4. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. F. Meekness. Elohim saves the meek. Compare Psalms 76 verse 9 and 149 verse 4. Psalm 76 verse 9. When Elohim arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth. Selah. And also Psalms 149 verse 4. For Yehovah takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Our Christian walk is a battle which is wholly dependent on faith in Yeshua as our Saviour. Without faith as a point of entry, the battle is lost from the outset. This faith leads unto justification, giving us the provision to be redeemed of our sins. Only in such a condition are we then conscripted into the army of Elohim to face the spiritual beasts of Satan. This vicious battle against an invisible enemy determines whether, whether or not one may attain eternal life, which is offered to all contenders. Only those who confess that Yeshua is Lord and fight in faith in him to the bitter end may attain eternal life. Homologeo, translated profess, is better rendered confess. Note that it is necessary to make a public confession that Yeshua is Lord for one to attain salvation promised at the end. Compare Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the master Yeshua, and shalt believe in thine heart that Elohim hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 13 and 14 I gave thee charge in the sight of Elohim, who quickeneth all things, and before Messiah Yeshua, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our master Yeshua the Messiah. Martureo, translated witnessed, is better, trans is better rendered testified for this verse to be placed in the right context. Yeshua testified before Pilate that he is the Messiah. We see this in Luke 23 verses 2 to 3. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Messiah, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, Thou sayest it. Also in John 18, verses 33 and 37. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Yeshua, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Then verse 37, Pilate then, said, then therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Yeshua answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. 
Timothy was charged to also keep this confession he had made and to keep the commandments given him. This he was to do without blemish, without cause for reproach, until Yeshua's return. Every generation has pretty much believed that they are living in the end times. From the first century Christians till now, an imminent return of Messiah has been anticipated. It is wise to live in great expectation of his return, as we are told that he shall return as a thief in the night. Compare Matthew 24 verses 42 and 42 to 44. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your master doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. 1 Timothy 6 verse 15 Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and not and only potentate, the King of kings and master, masters of masters. Paul undoubtedly was given similar revelation to that of John. Compare Revelation 19 verses 11 to 16. And I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make a war and, and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dripped in blood, and his name was called the Word of Elohim. And the armies which were in heaven followed followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of El Shaddai. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh, the proper translation there should be banner, because tattoos are outlawed in Torah, but we'll explain that when you do the teaching on Revelation one day. And he hath on his vesture and on his banner a name written, King of Kings, and master of masters. First Timothy 6 verse 16 Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. Amen. Athanasia is the Greek word for immortality. What does this immortality refer to? This Greek word is only also found in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 53 and 54, which we shall read. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Hence, although at death the soul does not die, and the spirit returns to Elohim, which we see in Ecclesiastes 12.7, because the souls of those currently dead are without incorruptible bodies, Yeshua is the only man at present who has spirit, soul, and incorruptible body, which defines immortality. Let's quickly read Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 to substantiate this. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto Elohim who gave it. So I shall repeat that regarding immortality. The Greek word is only found also in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 to 54. Hence, although at death the soul does not die and the spirit returns to Elohim, as we've seen in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, because the souls of those currently dead are without incorruptible bodies, Yeshua is the only man at present who has spirit, soul, and incorruptible body, which defines immortality. One may ask, 
What of Enoch and Elijah? It must be remembered that they were translated to heaven in corrupted bodies, bearing the DNA of Adam. They too must undergo the transformation that every other righteous man, dead or alive, shall experience at Yeshua's second advent. Hence Paul was not mistaken in declaring that at present, Yeshua is the only man who hath immortality. It is for this reason that he dwells in the light of Elohim the Father, to whom no man in a corruptible body may draw near lest they die. And we see this expressed in Exodus 33 verse 20 and John 1 verse 18. Exodus 33 verse 20 And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. This is Yehovah speaking to Moses. And also in John 1 verse 18, No man hath seen Elohim at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living Elohim, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Earthly riches are but dung in comparison to those heavenly. To those heavenly. Riches breed a sense of pride, which is the beginning of every created being's downfall, Satan being the precursor of such sin. It is foolish for one to depend on earthly riches which cannot be taken into the afterlife, as expressed in Matthew 6 verses 9 to 21. Matthew 6 verses 19 to 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Proverbs 11 verse 28. He that trusted in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Instead of preaching earthly riches in the pulpit, pastors and preachers are supposed to be teaching the complete opposite that's to say, piety, giving to the poor, and gathering riches in heaven. Let's read Revelation 3, verse 14 to 18 again. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. This describes the greater majority of Christendom in, Christendom in our day, which is a great pity. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19 Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Paul has repeated several times the need to hold on to eternal life. It is imperative that we understand that eternal life is not guaranteed to the believer. One must fight that good fight to the end. It is more difficult for the rich person to hold on, as money being the root of all evil, allows satanic forces to use the pursuit of riches to tempt the conscience of the soul into making bad choices, to please the lusts of the flesh. By so doing, sin buds and ultimately leads to death, which in essence means 
loss of that eternal life promised to those who are able to overcome to their dying day. Let's read Mark 10, verse 24 and 25. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Yeshua answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Paul entreats Timothy to keep parakatatheke, which is Greek for a trust or thing consigned to one's faithful keeping, used of the correct knowledge and pure doctrine of the gospel to be held firmly and faithfully and to be conscientiously delivered unto others. So quite a bit of a mouthful, but that's ultimately what the word means. He was equally advised to shun unhallowed, empty, useless discussions and oppositions of gnosis, which is Greek for knowledge, especially of things lawful and unlawful to Christians. This is the only place in the Bible where the word science is used. Yet in another 28 cases in the New Testament, it is rendered knowledge pertaining to Torah. There is a deluge of false knowledge which, since the so-called Enlightenment, championed by Voltaire in the 18th century and beyond, has corrupted the true knowledge of Elohim. There are indeed innumerable branches of false sciences in our midst, which have led billions down a path of destruction. Evolution, psychology, the Big Bang Theory, New Ageism, Theosophy, the Kabbalah, and Christian science are but few, are but a few of the myriad of false sciences concocted in the very pit of hell. First Timothy chapter six verse twenty one which some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace be with thee, amen. The first to Timothy was written from Laodicea, which is the chiefest city of Phrygia, Pacatiana. Many a professing Christian, through belief in these false forms of knowledge, all Gnostic and diabolical in nature, have strayed from truth and greatly jeopardized their hope of eternal life of which Paul so desperately reiterated we cling onto till the end. In closing, Paul closes off by wishing grace upon Timothy, which is his classic way of ending his epistles. Amen.